Hello, everyone. I'm letting everybody in there uh, so that we can all get started here properly and settle into tonight's conversation. Thank you all very much indeed for being here live. And of course, if you're watching the recording of this, you're very welcome as well. Okay, I see that there's still people coming in there. So just while, while you're all joining, I'll just briefly introduce myself. So my name is Susan Hayes Culleton, and I am the co-author of Positive Economics. And that is the leading search economics textbook we work and have been published by EDCO. And many of you may have found out about tonight as a result of perhaps being on EDCO's newsletter or being on our own Positive Economist newsletter or Twitter or Facebook, or of course, even Instagram, like the title of tonight's session. What I'm intending to do throughout the series of webinars is to really highlight how economics comes to life, but also in a very practical and academic way. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight is going to be focusing on the four factors of production, and we're going to use the Instagram, the app, and I'm going to tell you a lot about Instagram in how it operates as that case study of the four factors of production. But within that, we're also going to talk about short and long run, for example, and we will also talk the law of diminishing marginal returns as well, because all of those feature very much so in, in Instagram story. <laughs> Sorry, do you get it? Instagram story. I know, I'm hilarious. <laughs> I know what's worse is that I find my own jokes funny as opposed to anybody else doing so. Okay, so uh, just to give you a super brief background on me personally. So I started off being, I start, actually never studied economics for the leading search. A lot of people don't know that. I went on to study financial maths and economics in Galway and then went on to set up my first business and only company uh, back in 2010. And then I co-wrote Positive Economics with Brian and Trudy, my two co-authors who we went on to write the second book as well that was published in 2019. Separately, I work with, gratefully, thousands of teenagers every year through our Business Savvy Teen Academy. And that is where we run transition work experiences for companies and organizations across the country. And then separately, I've also authored um, the Savvy Woman's Guide to Making, sorry, Savvy Woman's Guide to Financial Freedom, Savvy Guide to Making More Money, and most recently, the book that is now in all schools that was offered to all schools, uh, complimentary from EDCO and CFA Ireland, and that is called Money Matters. Okay, so at this stage, I'd say, yep, yeah, we should all be here and good to go. Now, Please do, of course, put in any questions that you would like in the chat. You can also put it in through the questions and answers function. If you're watching this on YouTube afterwards, you can put it in the comments. And of course, I have, as I should always do, if I'm going to be taking Instagram as a case study, I also have Instagram open here. My handle on Instagram, as you can imagine, is Susan Hayes Culleton. Imagine that is as you might expect. OK, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and I am going to take you through what we're going to focus on tonight. So I'm going to start off with some facts about Instagram. OK, so here we go. Uh, let's share my screen here. OK, so as you can see here, we're going to focus on the four fact factors of production. The chapters in particular that I'm going to refer to are going to be chapter four the, around the market economy, where we introduce the concept of the factors of production, but in particular, chapter six, which focuses on costs. And that you'll see various different screenshots that I've taken from the book. But if you're following, following along, that's where I'm going to be coming from. Also, the factors of production do very much tie into microeconomics, whereas what I'm going to be telling you, of course, is also going to factor in things like enterprise and entrepreneurship. And as we look at how Instagram developed its story, I'm also going to be talking about employment and uh, also really big trends that happen, particularly in the consumer economy as well. So there's a couple of touches there with macroeconomics, but primarily tonight is going to focus on micro. OK, so here are a couple of fun facts. And of course, should any of you be preparing or well, preparing to prepare for your economics project next year. So if we've any fifth years or indeed TYs who might be here today. And there is of course the Leaving Start Economics Project. It's always important to have your sources. So you'll see that everything that I'm showing you has a source. This is called secondary research because it comes from somewhere else. These aren't facts that I gathered myself. I went and I found the source elsewhere. As you can see for any one of you, 
who will be either looking at the this afterwards, where we send out the links, all of the links that are in here, or looking at this on YouTube afterwards. You can see here, you'll be able to click on the various different links as well. So that means that if somebody wants to look up what you're showing them, they can. This is naturally very important if you're a practicing economist like me, or if you are somebody who is putting together a thesis in university, or if you're writing an article, let's say it might be published in a newspaper, and all of those types of things are what economists do. Okay, so over here on the left-hand side, you can see what my fun facts are. Well, they're Instagram fun facts, they're, they're not mine. So as you can see here, nearly half of Instagram users say they use Instagram to shop weekly. Uh, I would use Instagram quite a bit, less so, far less so than I use LinkedIn. I would use Instagram more than I would probably, I would certainly use Instagram less than I personally use Twitter. I probably would have Instagram and Facebook on a par. Uh, that would be me personally. But as we take a look around the world, you'll see how that compares. So as you're going, as we're going through these, you might have to think about, well, what are you like? What do you look at more? The most liked photograph photo on Instagram is a photo of an egg with almost 60 million likes, which I find bizarre, as I'm sure a lot of other people do too. Around three, 3 billion photos are shared on Instagram every day. And of course, that is the difference with the other social media platforms. Like if I think about LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn, for any of you who are not familiar with it, is the social media platform for people who are in the workplace. And so I'm. that's where I spend most of my posting time. And as, as you can imagine, I run a company and it's important that we market our company to the people who are hopefully going to buy our services. So we need to be wherever the, the customers are. And if you're studying business, you know that that's what marketing is all about. But if I think about LinkedIn, LinkedIn is really text and photograph driven. Also, when I think, let's say, of something like Twitter, yeah, that's probably phone. I, I naturally might use Twitter on my phone. I certainly, me personally, I use, probably I use LinkedIn, uh, balance between the desktop and the phone, but definitely I only ever use Instagram on my phone. Instagram is a much more natively, it is, a, it is more so uh, an app that you would use on your phone. And secondly, of course, it is naturally for more so imagery. What I don't want to specify yet is whether that's photos or, or video, because I want to talk you through Instagram's evolution and how it got to that point. But 3 billion photos are shared on Instagram every day. Only 3.6% of Instagram accounts are verified. And 50% of Instagram users use the Explore page every month. Personally, I'm not one of them. But um, then again, there's only one and two, which is a lot, but it's also not everyone. Posts with a location get 79% more engagement. Generally, I would add those in all right. Now, the hashtag, I, I will come back to that a little bit later on. I do certainly want to talk to you about the hashtags later on when we talk about the law of diminishing marginal returns. But posts with at least one hashtag average 6% more engagement. Twitter actually was where the hashtag began. Uh, I use them quite a bit. Uh, certainly, I would encourage anybody to, if you're going to look at the LC economics hashtag, for example, I, I use it on Twitter. I'll just uh, give you a quick shout out there. Um, if I go on to Twitter and I go into LC Economics over here, for example, and of course I could do this as well on Instagram, but I'm sure you're all there already. So, so if I now when I was tweeting today about tonight, uh, right there you go. For example, a superwoman here, by the way, Caroline McHale. She always has great, great posts. So she, you can see here, and um, she put together a summary of the budget there on September 27th. And um, that was me talking about a previous one of these. And uh, as you can see here, there's also other, yeah, this is one that I put out there on the hashtag as well. This was a competition from European Movement Ireland. Um, this is Dermot Canning, who also put up a poster with um, QR codes for other resources. This is one about money matters that I had put out there before and uh, a range of others, as you can see here, Stephen Kinsler was talking about different events that were taking place. Now that was in March of last year around the morning webinar. So hashtags, of course, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with them, but a hashtag is a way in which to check in with a community and where a community of practice is already taking place. As you can see here, so posts with at least one hashtag average 6% more engagement and 7% of women in the US use Instagram. Interestingly, now I don't have this fact up here. Interestingly, the percentage of people who use Instagram is actually slightly more male than female. Uh, based on what I saw, 52% of users of Instagram are male, 48% uh, are female, based on a piece of research that I came across when I was researching for today. 
So it is the, uh, the most downloaded app in the world. TikTok comes in it's in second place, followed by Facebook and WhatsApp. And that is, it has been around since 2010. That is an impressive spot on the download chart. So it is the most downloaded app in the world. Again, that probably doesn't come as a big surprise here because a lot of people who would have used Facebook at the beginning wouldn't necessarily have necessarily used it natively on their phone. What I mean by natively is for gone straight to the phone to download Facebook. A lot of people would have been using that, let's say on a laptop or on a desktop uh, computer. And bear in mind that I remember the year Facebook introduced video and it's, it's certainly not that long ago. I don't want to quote the year in case I'm wrong, but I just want to make the point that Facebook in the earlier days, again, was quite text driven, then photograph driven, then video driven. And now Facebook and Instagram have, have slightly merged in their, their capability. When you look at the world's most used platform, this actually surprised me. Uh, this came from Hootsuite, again, quoting you my source because this is secondary research. And uh, Facebook is actually number one at 2.9 billion users, and that is global. So I think it is important to remember this. Certainly when I talk to the teenagers that I work with, a lot of them aren't on Facebook. A lot of them would be more so on Instagram and Snapchat in particular, and of course, um, TikTok as well. But it, I just found this interesting as actually Facebook leads the way at the moment based on the, the research that I have here from Hootsuite, which as you can see, all of the sources are down here at the bottom. That's followed by YouTube. And after that, then we have WhatsApp that's next. Now I'm an avid WhatsApp user. I'm a very, very avid WhatsApp user indeed. Instagram is next. Now WeChat, I'm on WeChat as well. Uh, WeChat is the, well, it's like the WhatsApp in China, but it is far more than that. So it's like WhatsApp and it's and it's like Amazon on, on the same app. And it's like ordering a taxi on the same app. Like WeChat would be uh, an app that does far more than what any social media would be. It would also be e-commerce and a range of other things. TikTok, of course, I don't have to introduce that to anybody, the video app. FB Messenger, which I thought was quite high. I very, very rarely use that. And then as you can see, there's, there's all sorts of other ones. Snapchat, relatively speaking, in this, from the global usage point of view, is quite low. Like I say, I would say, as when it comes to Irish teenagers, is dramatically higher. Okay, so moving on then from there. Now let's look at this from the context of the factors of production. So like I mentioned here, chapter four talks about the market economy and it's very much an, an introduction. We just basically mention the factors of production there, but in here, there's, there's far more. So we looked at demand and supply respectively and concluded the price is the main factor in determining both. And we refer to the point where demand and supply meet is equilibrium. So that's where there's no tendency to change. That is where demand and supply meet. And generally the graph looks like that. And here is where you have P and Q, right? Price and quantity of that equilibrium. So then we notice that utility or satisfaction is the base of demand and the cost of production is the base of supply. It is these costs, namely money, that must be paid for the inputs to make something. And what are those four things? So there are four inputs, we've land, labor, capital, and enterprise. So what I'm now going to do is take you through what the land is in the context of Instagram. What is the labor? I'm gonna show you the change in employment. I might surprise you with some of my statistics here. Capital, I'm going to show you how much money, how much capital that Instagram actually needed to grow. And then when it was sold, it was sold to Facebook and Facebook is now called Meta. And then finally also enterprise. So what did the entrepreneurs do? The two founders who set it up, why did they set it up? And then what did they sell it for? Which I will tell you about. When did they leave? When did they actually leave? Both of them are gone, by the way, from Instagram. And also what I'm going to talk you through is the evolving nature of the business. So what did, when it came to entrepreneurial thinking, what did actually change as time went on? That's when we'll talk about the Instagram reels. We'll talk about stories and where all that came, came about. Okay, land. The picture on the right there is Instagram's HQ. It is in oh, Mountain View in California. And that is, I've been there. No, not to Instagram's uh, HQ, HQ. I haven't been to there, but I've been to Mountain View, California. And of course, Mountain View, California is in Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is in between San Francisco and San Jose. In I'm, I'm doing this because one is north and one is south. And Silicon Valley is about an hour's drive. I've driven it. And it is... Like it's basically 
a road. <laughs> it's a road, but uh, Silicon Valley itself is more so an area. And then, of course, that is where a lot of the companies that we know are headquartered globally. So whether that's um, Facebook, Meta now, uh, Twitter, um, uh, Microsoft is actually in Seattle. A lot of the tech companies who you might be familiar with, they're, they're based there. So anyway, this, this picture here is coming from that. So what is the land ultimately that Instagram has? Well, of course, as you can imagine, first of all, there's buildings. That's always the obvious one, right? The actual land that they're built on is, is the land that w Instagram need, needed. It began with two people. And just very briefly to tell you how it began is um, two people, and I'll tell you their names in a little while, Two people decided to come together and create this app where you could share your location. Now, nobody would do that today. The reason is nobody would do that today is right now I can do a drop pin on Google Maps and I can send it to you. I could share my live location on WhatsApp. Of course, Facebook also owns that and I could send it to you. Like there is, there is, there's Snapchat, as you know, has a geolocation feature as well. So if I was to say, right, I'm going to create an app today. I'm hoping people will use it and they'll share their location. And then we'll generate advertising based on that location. I wouldn't be going anywhere because it's already been done and well, well, well done at this stage. So that's where it began. And but when they did that, when they start off with that, what the, the one of the partners, like the romantic partners of one of the co-founders said they didn't like they were using an iPhone 4. They said that the photo sharing capability of the app and they were only determining whether they would use photos or not. They just said it wasn't good enough and it could have been better for the phone. And then Instagram was born. So when the two founders started up, of course, they wouldn't have had the buildings that, that are out in Mountain View now, but they do today. Now, this is the one, of course, that I wanted to come over to in particular, is that when it comes to land, and we think about that in the context of economics, we also think about like the physical infrastructure that goes in to uh, making things happen. And of course, that's different to capital. I'm going to talk about capital as well. But the servers in the data center is what's very, very important. This is what creates the ability for me to put up a picture right now. I could take a picture of me delivering this live here this evening and I could put it up on Instagram straight away. You would have it as fast as I, as soon as it's posted, you could have it. So the photograph isn't actually sitting on my phone. The photograph is in the cloud. Where is the cloud? Well, it's overhead, <laughs> but ultimately that picture is stored in a data center. And how you or I have access to it is through data, it's through 4G. 4G is what I have here beside me anyway. That is what's there. So as a result, the servers and the data centers, that is what actually stores all of the actual data that you and I can access. And then of course, the other thing is the devices, right? Is that we do need for, for you and me to be able to interact with Instagram, we need a device. So when it comes to the physical infrastructure that makes Instagram happen, it's not, and let me be very clear about this, with a very different example, and then I'll come back to it. I have a glass of water here beside me. Let's say that I made glasses, right? So I'm a manufacturer, glass manufacturer, and I make glasses, right? So we, we produce glasses, and then we put them into Super Value, we put them into Musgraves, put them into Dunn's, we sell them, Ikea, Home Store, and more, et cetera. If you bought those glasses, that's then you buy the glasses, you buy the economic good, and off you go and you use them. You see, the thing is with Instagram, it's different, is that all of us as users of Instagram, we are the product. We are creating the product for them. By me putting up a picture up on Instagram, that is me creating something for somebody else to look at. By me creating a story with a sticker on it, that is me, again, creating an interaction for them. It is creating something for you to engage with. For let's say Christian, Cristiano Ronaldo, one of the most um, influential influencers on Instagram, when he posts a reel, then he is creating that. So the point I'm trying to make is that in comparison to this, my company, let's say, was producing glasses and then you sell them. I, I sell them to you. You have no role in actually the production of the product. In Instagram's case, we're all involved in Instagram. We are the product. We are providing them with the inventory or the product that they then go on to sell. And what they sell is our attention and our interaction. And of course, they will also do that according to the data that we provide. So if I put up a post on Instagram, which of course I could right now, but I'm not going to do it because I'm here with you. I take a picture of me delivering this 
this session live right now and then I put it up on Instagram then I and I say that I'm based uh, currently I'm here in Dublin so I'm sharing my location I'm sharing my interest in economics I'm sharing and let's say particularly if I was to put in the hashtag LC economics think about all of the information that I'm giving Instagram and then Instagram can use its algorithm then to try to sell me economics courses or economics revision courses or economic conferences in Budapest just coming off the top of my head now so therefore of course the ability to do that means that I need to have a device so also and of course Instagram doesn't provide all, all of us with devices it provides us with an app that's free to download so land in the case of Instagram consists of buildings servers and data centers and also the devices that we use in order to engage with them. That's the physical the physical things, the physical architecture that makes this up. Now, labor. I want to be very careful with you on my source for this. And the reason for this is that I searched a number of times for the number of people that work in Instagram. And I got all sorts of numbers. I got this one, and this is the one that I got most often. I got over a thousand employees. I got 5,000 employees. Remember, Instagram is owned by Facebook. So therefore, it's not an independent business that stands on its own two feet, that publishes its own stock analysis report where I would have gotten that data. Instead, of course, Instagram is swallowed into that company. And that's what makes it hard for me to get a load of other figures I can get for you. No problem. And I have them for you, but not this one. So I do want to just point out again, you can see my source. So if you want to go and check that out, you can. And this is the figure that it quoted is that Instagram, recent data revealed that Instagram is 450 employees. Personally, I think it is probably higher, but since I wanted to, I wanted to get a source for you that you could rely on, I would say this recent data probably refers more so to a 2022 figure, but let's stick with what we've got. And these employees service the social media platforms, more than 1.3 billion active monthly users. That of course is now higher as well. This seems like a small number of employees when compared to Facebook's more than 58,600 employees who service Facebook's nearly 3 billion users. And Twitter has 6,600 employees for what's one third of monthly users of Instagram. So let me just explain a couple of things here. Number one, I might surprise you with this. Instagram was sold, and I remember it being sold. Instagram was sold to Facebook in 2014 for a billion euro. One billion dollars between stock and cash one billion dollars there was 13 staff one three 13 staff built a business that was so focused on strong technology that could handle scope and scale through the data centers and, and the engagement and everything i mentioned to you earlier that was sold for one billion dollars and there was 13 staff 13 staff i've often thought about that as a business owner myself is to think how how do you get to that scale with 13 staff? But anyway, they did. Now, moving on from there, as you can see, there's an awful lot more staff there now. And also, uh, Facebook, Instagram is worth a lot, a lot more money now than, than a billion euro. But let's just think about, like, who are we talking about? Well, first of all, when it comes to, to labor, we'll often think of staff, first of all, right? The people who are actually full-time employed. Now, if any of you have been following the news over the past while, you will know, and particularly in 20. 23 in particular, um, th this started in 2022, but in 2023 in particular, there's been a lot of tech layoffs. So I want to reinforce one point, that the information that I have on the right-hand side is probably not the most recent, and therefore it's probably not as accurate as it should be. You Then you say to me, okay, but Susan, why did you put it there? The reason that I put it there is to point out the difference in the number of staff that Instagram have relative to the others. So while the numbers may be changed now because of two reasons, one is the growth of the businesses and two is because of the layoffs that have happened at an employment level. I still want to point out that there's a really big difference between Instagram's number of staff versus Facebook and Twitter's and the others as well. OK, that's the only point I wanted to make. And also, of course, you can see here, I'm directing you back to the source where you can interrogate that. Now. If today's webinar was an update on Instagram's business, I wouldn't have used those figures. Today's, today's webinar is focusing on the factors of production and understanding economies of scale and other economic topics. That's why I'm quoting this. Secondly, companies as well, like Instagram, often have a lot of contractors. So for example, um, Microsoft could be a client of mine, right? Microsoft could be a client of mine where Microsoft says, okay, will you come in and run our transition work experience program? 
or um, for example, uh, Johnson & Johnson is applying to ours. We run their, their uh, transition work experience program. We're a contractor. So yes, I, me personally, I could be on the site today working for that company, but I'm not staff. I'm not staff. We're brought in as a contractor. So you think about all the types of contractors that would work in these companies, the cleaners, the catering company, people who lead work experiences there, graphic designers who might be outsourced, event managers, all of those types of services would all be contracted in as well. All of that feeds into the labor that goes into a company like Instagram. But then, of course, this is also what makes Instagram's business model a little bit different, is that think about who really draws people to Instagram. Influencers. Influencers do. And of course, I could, if you wanted, I could go off and I could find the various different influencers who I might, who, who, who share updates on Instagram. Now, what is an influencer? So a nano influencer. So nano is, is like a, it's a word that implies very, very small. So a nano influencer would have between 500 and 5,000 followers, for example. And then up from there, we get to all sorts of other influencers. So again, going back to Cristiano Ronaldo, or we might think of the Kardashians, or we could, anyway, you know yourselves who the influencers are. Ultimately, they work for Instagram. Not Instagram doesn't pay them. They come, the brands who represent who they want to, the brands who want to gain exposure to their respective followers actually pay them. But one way or the other, unless there were influencers, well, then Instagram wouldn't be as big as it is. It wouldn't be as engaging as it is. You wouldn't look at it as often as you do if influencers weren't there. And on the other hand, there's no point in influencers posting if you don't have viewers. Ultimately, by you scrolling down through your Instagram feed, let's say every day, on average, people generally look, the daily active users would be very, very high. So unless you actually look at Instagram, then of course, there's no point in the influencers posting and Instagram wouldn't have a business. So you too work without being paid for Instagram. How you are being paid ultimately or the reward that you're ultimately getting is you're getting a free app. All of the content that is there is there for free. So if I do a reel and I talk about the four factors of production and I do three minutes on explaining them using Instagram as a case study and then you can get that content for free. You can see Cristiano Ronaldo talking about his you know, top five moments in, in the World Cup. You can see... Um, Kim Kardashian talking about how to or all the makeup tutorials that's there or the dance routines that are there or the free food videos that are there all of those of course you get for free so that is that is the that is the reward ultimately but all of those are ultimately what make up the labor that goes into making Instagram a success okay let's go on again now capital how much money did Instagram need in order to get to where it is today? Well, started off here, 6th of October, 2010. The seed round, now seed, I am seed. Um, I'm sorry, there's a lot of words there that sound the same. I was the master of ceremonies or I was the host, I was the interviewer at the recent Venture Capital Conference in Ireland. It was run by Intertrade Ireland, which is the body responsible for North-South uh, trade uh, across the country. It was set up as a result of the Good Friday Agreement almost 25 years ago, as you know, we're heading for that anniversary now shortly. And during that conference, I interviewed a range of people who had raised money. And I also talked to people who had sold businesses. I talked to people who had put their business on the stock market and various other things like that. In essence, that is when, when you raise money in that context, venture capital means that, let's say I was the founder of Instagram. What I would do is that I would go to you and I would say, I have this idea. I think it can be amazing. I think we can have massive reach. I think we can make a lot of money. I just need money to get started. If I borrow the money now from the bank, I don't think I'm going to be able to repay it fast enough because it might take a lot of time for us to make that money. But when we do make that money, I think we'll be able to make a lot. So how about this? I sell you part of the company and you give me money for that. And what you get as part of the company is you get the opportunity then to get some of the profits as we go on as a dividend or alternatively if we then go on and sell the company at a later date which instagram did then you and we we sell for a higher amount than than, than it's worth now you'll you'll be able to profit that way so a seed round is what you do to get going to start off series a is what you do next then to take the business to the next level series b is what happens after that and then you can go all the way down the ultimate so on the 6th of October, 2010, Instagram raised half a million. 
half a million and you know what else they raised that in two weeks now i don't know when they actually started like started properly but in two weeks they raised half a million and uh, four months later four months, five months later february the 2nd 2011 they raised seven million seven million seven million was what they raised uh series a it was what they raised and the number of investors at the time as you can see there were five so there was five investors that they that contributed to 7 million. 14 months later, from the 2nd of February 2011 to the 5th of April 2012, they then raised 50 million. Six investors, and I have all the details on the investors who they were, if you're interested, you can click on that link and you can go and you can find them. But the point I'm making is, is that that's the amount of money that they raised. They raised $50 million to continue building the business. This shows massive interest on the part of investors and a huge belief in what the company could do. Of course, it didn't take long for those investors to get a lot of money back. So let's talk about the short run and the long run, because I'm now going to be moving into the factor of enterprise. When it comes to entrepreneurial thinking, what was going on here? What did the business do? How did it succeed? But then how did it grow and develop as well? Now, as, you, as a lot of you know, there's two time periods, short and long. There's the short run and the long run. So a period of time during which at least one factor of production is fixed in supply. So the that's the short run. And the long run is when every factor can change. So as you can see over here, I, I and I came up with the picture brief for the artist between Hillary's Deli. As you can see here, the difference between the short run and the long run. And the point of this picture is, is that if there are loads and loads and loads of people who are flying in the door looking for the products that Hillary's, Hillary's Deli is offering, well, then, of course, then people have to stand in a queue because you can't get staff fast enough or you can't expand fast enough. You can't raise money fast enough. And also the entrepreneur just can't come up with new ideas fast enough in order to be able to deal with it. So what do they do? Well, they say, OK, well, what's the easiest thing we could do here? Do you know what we'll do? Let's put more money into our infrastructure and let's enable people to be able to buy and pay online so that then that will speed up the queue. That's changing one factor production. Or let's take on another staff member. If we can take on another staff member, well, then at least we can speed up how quickly we can serve customers. Right. That, that, that led the queue. Whereas in the long run, you can do everything. You can go to the bank and you can raise, you can borrow 250,000. You can double the size of the building. You can take on five more staff. You can come up with five new marketing ideas to bring in more business as well. In the long run, you can do everything. And the short run and the long run, the difference here is not time. It's how, qu how quickly you can adjust your factors of production. So the time period, just to read through this, the time periods involved in each of the above can vary in terms of months or years and industry to industry. So popular deli that uses capital and labor, like the building and the kitchen, et cetera, equipment and staff, and is constantly busy, will not be able to expand its premises immediately in response to an increase in demand. So instead, they'd have to apply for planning permission, negotiate with contractors, and building the extension, all that takes time. So the premises of the capital is fixed in supply, and the only method as, you, as I mentioned in my example, might be take on more staff or something else like that. But in the long run, everything is variable. In the long run, all factors are variable. The time period for the daily to increase in size, uh, its short run time period, and contrast this to a car manufacturer where the corresponding time period might be several years. So let's think about this. Let's think about Instagram in the short and the long run. Right? In the short run, there is more money. Months apart. They went from taking in half a million to seven million five months apart. So that, that half a million, I'd say, was spent very, 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 very quickly. So this is something they could do in the short term. Do you honestly think that they built the building that I showed you in the short run? No. And then, of course, to go from 13 staff when they sold the company in 2014 up to the number that it is today, that also, of course, takes time as well. So let me now take you through the entrepreneurial journey. Look at the enterprise factor of production. So in October 2010, as you saw, the money was raised, the half a million, in two weeks. And there, as you can see, Instagram was launched by Kevin Sistrom and Mike Crager. By December, at, so that was just two months uh, afterwards, Instagram had already reached one million registered users. Now, as you know, <laughs> the number is a lot higher today, but in two months, it had one million users. That is what made this really interesting. If you can show you can get to a million users in that period of time, investors are likely to be very interested. And of course, then that's when they went on to raise their 7 million. Now, in April, sorry, it was 2012. 
apologies, thought it was 2014, it was 2012. Do you know what I'm confusing with? What's up? So anyway, in 2012, April, um, Facebook was acquired, acquired Instagram for a billion dollars in cash and stock. And then as of January, 2013, it had a hundred million active users. Now you think about the data servers that would have needed to be able to handle to go from a million to a hundred million. That is, a, and remember as well, when you're going down through Instagram, it's constantly updating, constantly, constantly, constantly updating. You need some serious technology that can do that at scale, drawing huge, huge numbers of people who are using it. But also as well, remember, this is going out all over the world. Then by June 2018, so it took five years then to grow tenfold again. And uh, by June 2018, Instagram had reached 1 billion monthly active users. So what do you need? And let's not go any further for a moment. As an entrepreneur, what do you need here? Well, you need ways in which to make this different. You need, and, and the way in which you made it different is number one, it was natively designed around photographs. Number two, it was natively designed to be used on the phone. And then of course, there was all the hashtags were used and there was a range of other things that happened. Now, not even getting onto the, the stuff that I'm talking about here yet, but it was all about sharing pictures. If you, I don't know if any of you remember this, but at the time, Flickr, F-L-I-C-K-R, and Pinterest were growing roundabout at the same speed back, back then. But then Instagram is really the one that seems to have taken over. Now, Instagram most followed account as of September 2021 uh, is at Instagram with over 400 million, million followers. Now, let's just take a look at that. So Instagram now has, now has, Okay, where are we? At Instagram. Now it's 621 million followers. So what does it need to do in order to, to make that happen? Well, of course, do have a lot of engaging content. As far as I'm aware, and I, I don't know if I'm 100% accurate in this, but I do know that this did happen. I just don't know if it was the only one that happened. Instagram or in, when it came to the Instagram story, which I'll talk about in a moment of when that was introduced, Izzy Wheels is the only Irish company, if, if, that, if I'm right, I think is the only Instagram account in Ireland that has been featured as an Instagram story by Instagram itself. Story by Instagram. If I'm correct, I think it's the only one. If it's not the only one, it's the first one. Uh, yeah, this one over here. So exciting news, the Izzy Wheel sisters, Izzy and Alva are going to be the feature story on the official Instagram page, thrilled and honored at our mission. That was when, 260 weeks ago. So that, that's 2017. Right, so maybe maybe they weren't the only one, but I think they were the first one. But I do remember, because I, I remember I, I've, I've interviewed them. I've interviewed the sisters. And they that was one of the points that, that they made is that Izzy Queens, I'm pretty sure so it must be the first one, if not the only one, but they were featured um, on Instagram's actual story themselves. So also, I also mentioned about the egg tube, but this is the one that I just want to talk to you about over here. Right, so let me just, let me just zoom in here. So when it comes to in the developments that Instagram has had over the years, it, is, it introduced Instagram stories in 2016. So as and we know, Snapchat has really built their model around that. But Instagram stories is where you can put up a story and then it disappears after 24 hours unless you make it part of your highlights. And on your story, you can have a range of stickers as well. I use them a lot for question stickers when I'm asking my audience something. I also use them for polling. I use them for quizzes. I use, I think Instagram stories are, are very useful. And then we had IGTV in 2018. And IGTV is Instagram TV, where then you could go live. And I've often used it for particularly more so our clients when, for example, we have a client in the States that is focusing on stock analysis. It's called VectorVest. And I've often, when I've been on site with them, either in the States or at a, at a show teaching people about investing. I'll often open up IGTV live and I will have, I'll do a quick video all around maybe how to understand a dividend. Some of you would have under, would have been working on dividends, for example, or dividend yields or PE ratios in accounting, but they also apply very much as well to when you're working with this from a business point of view. I might use them then. And then of course, reels. So reels were introduced in 2020. Reels, for anybody that doesn't know, a reel is when you can put a collection of pictures together our collection of videos together. I really like them. Uh -huh. Again, there we go. I really like them. Um, I, I have to say, I really like them. And that is also 
more and more where people are actually sending their attention is, is on engaging with reels as well. I find that they're a great way to collate a se selection of, me of memories. Um, we did one, particularly I, I did a, a finance retreat uh, with the company in Dubai a little while ago, a um, month ago, in fact. And our reel, for example, is... Um, not there to be seen now. Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, that isn't quite there to be seen now. All right. It's somewhere. It's, oh, yes, I do actually know exactly where it is. Anyway, I don't want it to take up take up your time in, in looking for it. But uh, so a reel is when, when you put a, a collection of a collection of images or videos together there. And also there is a range of templates. Personally, I don't use the templates, but I do use I put together my own reads and also what Instagram is very good at doing is suggesting how you can fit all of those together. So as you, my point here is that Instagram's on enterprise has had to evolve from from this point here. If I was to just, you know, bounce between the between the different boxes, what you need here are two things. You need money and you need marketing. And perhaps one would have led to the other. You would have needed money for the development. You probably wouldn't need an awful lot of wages for these two co-founders to start off at the time, but they definitely would have needed money and marketing, and that's what it would have got them to one, one million uh, registered users. And of course, then they would have needed more money, but also they would have needed more marketing again in order to be able to, to be able to get to the number of users that, that they had. By the time you're getting over here to January 2013, you need a lot of investment in technology, the, the land, the ability to actually serve customers. And, and bringing in more staff, but bringing in a lot of investment into the hardware, into the software, into the staff, into the, into the building, et cetera. That's what you would have needed. Over here, you would have needed to scale even more of that, both marketing, money, staff, and also, of course, the engagement in with Facebook as it was then at the time. By the time you get over here, you need innovation. You need to come up with new ideas. And of course, the new ideas are the Instagram stories, IGTV, Reels, et cetera. Okay. So I've already sh shown you that. So I, I just now just want to bring you on to this. And this is what I actually got from Meta's. Uh, Meta, of course, is a parent company now. Facebook has changed its name to Meta, short for Metaverse. And uh, the Metaverse is something I'm watching with intrigue, I have to say. That is probably something I'll be talking to you about in a webinar at some stage as well. But we leave that for now. And I just want to, uh, I just picked this up here. I was reading through the earnings report that came out from Meta and it was last December. And it was in February, but the, the report was in February, but the detail was the last quarter of Meta's earnings. So that's that's where it's coming from. Published in February, arising from December. And I just want to, I'll just read it out to you. Oh, I'll just read it out to you here. And I don't seem to be able to do that. Okay, let me just scroll back in. So it says, first, let's talk about our AI discovery engine. Facebook and Instagram are shifting from being organized solely around people and accounts you follow to increasingly showing more relevant content recommended by our AI systems. AI, of course, is artificial intelligence. And this covers every content format, which is something that makes our services unique, but we're especially focused on short-term video since Reels is growing so quickly. And that's why I wanted to direct your focus towards that. I'm the person who's talking, talking here is Mark Zuckerberg, CEO. I'm really proud of our progress here. Reels play across Facebook and Instagram have more than doubled over the past year with the social component of people resharing reels has grown even faster and has more than doubled on both apps in just the last six months. Like I say, I remember attending a seminar uh, that Facebook gave and when they were talking about video was introduced one year. I don't want to quote the year in case I'm wrong, but what I do remember them saying was that it then within that year became 40% of the content uploaded. So the speed here at which innovation needs to be factored in is very fast. Okay. So um, now I just wanted to also touch on the law of diminishing marginal returns, right? So I'm just going to touch on that because I know we are coming to the end of our session. And very, first, first of all, like I said, the business model, how Instagram actually works, the business model is through advertising. I don't pay to download and to gain access to the content on Instagram. I am the content that other people are paying for. Other, either other people are looking to engage with what I'm there or else there are companies who are seeking to sell to me, and ultimately they are paying for my attention. This is the demographic. So 17.1% um, of men between 18 to 24 years are on 
Instagram. And this is the share of Instagram's advertising audience by age group and gender. Now, if I am correct, I am pretty sure this is global as well. If I'm correct, I think this is global as well. 13 to 17, 4.7% uh, male, 4% of females. Uh, and then when it gets to 25 to 34 years old as well, then we have obviously a uh, female and male, and then it starts to decline after that. So that is share of Instagram's advertising audience. So when businesses are trying to target this particular age group, you can now see where, where that money is going and where it's chasing. Of course, the engagement level for Instagram is very high around these age groups, and that's, that's naturally why that happens. Okay. Now, I also just wanted to talk about economies of scale. So we talk about economies of scale and in, in the book we talk about it, we talk about internal and external economies of scale and we talk about dis economies of scale as well. This is just one statistic that I found. Again, um, you can see my sources over here. I just think it's very interesting to see that in 2022, last year, Instagram generated an estimated 51.4 billion revenue. That's gross money that it took in mostly in advertising, and that accounts for almost 45% of Facebook's total revenue. Now, if I was right with my 450 staff, or if it's more accurately 1,000, even if it's more accurately 5,000, look at the amount of people that Instagram employs relative to Facebook. Massive difference. Also, Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars just over a decade ago. Now look at what it's generating on an annual basis. That is what you call economies of scale. By the company actually buying in something that is huge engagement from a specific cohort of people where the people who are there are willing to buy, come back and re-engage all the time and also send real, well now send reels on to their friends or have highlights of stories or sorry, have stories or story highlights, et cetera. Because of that, you can now see that Facebook achieved a huge amount of growth as a result of Instagram. That is ultimately economies of scale. So finally, moving on then, finally to the law of diminishing marginal returns. Again, I came up with the, the design brief for this cartoon. If you ever want to know anything about anything that is in the book, ask me, I will tell you. The three of us wrote the book and we all had different, different aspects. So there's certain chapters that I would have had more influence on. Not this one, this was Brian's chapter. Brian, Brian O'Connor, he wrote uh, he wrote the cost chapter. And then what happens when you work with co-authors is then another person edits and then another person edits and then, oh, on and on and on we go. But um, I, I've, I've told you in previous webinars, in particular ones that I started off writing, the one with the financial sector was all me. <laughs> that has me written literally uh, all over it. The international trade chapter, that was Trudy's chapter all over. And then, as I say, we apply our own layer to it. But I was the one that often wrote the design briefs. And this was one that I just wanted Hillary to have hands coming out of her everywhere. And she was doing all sorts of things. She was making, she was making the, the, the ham rolls. She was taking the money. She was making the coffee. She was doing the accounts. She was trying to figure out what she was going to do next. She was organizing packaging. And this was what the designer came back with. So just wanted to give you a quick note on that. But what is the law of diminishing marginal returns? Well, that is when, when you start, when you add something, like what, if you, what if you add loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of money to a business? Well, if there's nothing to spend on, it's no good to you. You might say, oh, Susan, there's always something to spend on. Mm, not really. Because let's say that, that I have 100 million in my bank account right now. And, I'm work and I, I own Hillary's Deli. And there's space for like 10 people in the shop. And two of them are staff. What good is the 100 million to me? Because if the shop is already full of customers, I can only have two staff. Well, then the only thing that I can do is expand. And let's say I don't want to expand. Well, then the money is no good to me. Similarly, let's say that I'm in the same, same situation and I have 1,000 euros in the bank. And I'd say, okay, do you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to take on a staff member and I'm going to prob I'll probably get, you know, maybe I might get a, a week or two weeks out of that person, but I'll take in enough money as over those two weeks if I took on another person. And then I realized, sure, where would they stand? Where would they work? All I would be doing is paying out money to people and they'd be falling over each other. So the thing is, is that the law of diminishing marginal returns means that if you keep on adding something, you actually don't get any further or worse is that you actually prevent progress from happening. If I, if I own Hillary's Deli, we've, we've 10 tables, we've enough for two staff and me, and then let's say I hire three more people. 
well then everyone's going to get in each other's way then people standing behind the counter people taking orders people other taking people orders sorry i'm into and sorry 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 coffee's being spilled someone else is oh anarchy so the law of diminishing marginal returns is if you keep on adding a factor production then the benefit stops happening it first of all it slows down the benefit slows down the pace of it slows down to the point of then where it can go the other way where it's actually negative so, as you can see here in our text, we say, suppose that Hillary is the sole employee. Hillary is responsible for ordering supplies, making the produce, serving customers, and ensuring the premises is clean. Regardless of how hard Hillary works, and I know what it feels like to be Hillary, <laughs> as someone who has run my own business for over 12 years, and I remember when we didn't have staff, I was Hillary. Regardless of how hard Hillary works, it does not take long to realize that extra help would be beneficial and profitable. So Hillary hires the assistant, John, and the production in at the Adelie Rises. Then she goes on and she takes on Andrew and then Angela. And then very soon, Hillary isn't going to be able to make much more difference to the place unless she expands, etc. So how is this relevant for Instagram? Well, here's my last example of the night. Hashtags. And that was the creator's account on Instagram. What they did was they recommended this number down here. And that was three to five hashtags. You can put up to 30 hashtags on a post on Instagram. However, this says... And this was their own recommendation, is that you would only put in up to three to five, not go up as far as 30, because after that, people just stop. And the work that goes into which hashtag should I put in, which one should, should I choose to add in, make sure that they're right. And then reacting to them and all that sort of thing. So what they're saying is keeping the number of hashtags between three to five. Then they have a whole load of other do's there for people who work in marketing and who use Instagram as, as a primary area of their business. So this is the law of diminishing marginal returns in action is that the more hashtags that you put in, not to say that you get any better as a result. So, of course, as you can imagine, the last slide that I have is this one, which is, of course, if you would like um, to either connect in with me, of course, feel free to do so. Again, I'm at Susan Hayes Culliton and very happy to hear from any of you. If any of you have ever any questions or anything, of course, please feel free to send me a DM. I post about all sorts of things. And um, this one over here is... From money matters and uh, this one over here is when i was emceeing a conference a couple of weeks ago in belfast um but i often talk about various other different things uh, along with the lines of as you'll see uh, particularly i i go for breakfast every morning i think over breakfast every morning and uh, and i talk about that in my foodie spots because of course that's what instagram is for and i use a range of other social media but in particular if anybody does want to connect in with me there you are most welcome so i'm going to stop sharing i'm going to go back there and just check I don't see that we have any questions or that we have any chat in there. That's no problem at all. Um, what I'm going to do is, as I always do, is that we will be putting a blog post up on The Positive Economist. Then uh, we will be following up. Of course, I'm guessing that everybody who is here tonight has uh, registered through Zoom. And so you will automatically get this recording and the associated resources and the blog post. If you are watching this on YouTube, and um, we're going with the link is in the is in the description about how you can register for our newsletter so that then you get the same. And also uh, that's how you can be updated about future webinars as well. Our next one is taking place in a couple of weeks time. You'll all be updated and you will be updated about that both through ourselves. And if you're on the Edco mailing list, you will be updated there too. But to each and every one of you, thank you very, very much for being here. I appreciate it. I hope that tonight was useful so that you have a sense of how Instagram really is an example of factors of production. And I wish you all the very best in all that you do. Bye.